Uh, a few just notes and c comments at the outset b before we get started. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Alan Hockley for the wonderful exhibition we have out here in the corridor of Baker Library. And if any of you have not taken a chance to look at it so far, uh, I'd urge you to do so. Alan, along with some students and uh, the staff at, here at uh, uh, Baker Berry Library, uh, put together really a, a really uh, a wonderful e exhibition as uh, part of this conference. Uh, secondly, I'd like to mention that that oval table that you see in the middle of our room right now is one of the tables that was in the room at, uh, during the negotiations at the actual Portsmouth Peace, uh, uh, Peace Treaty Conference. And um, it was actually there during the signing, during the signing ceremony. The, the actual signing took place on a very long table, a lot of people sitting around it, but this was that particular table was in the room. Uh, when it's not in this room, which is most of the time, it actually sits in the, in the office of the president of Dartmouth College. So it's uh, been a very nice item uh, for Dartmouth for many, um, many years. We've seated the various uh, panels together. We, we have today's panel here in front of us. I'll be introducing the various people before uh, each paper, then uh, I'll in introduce the two um, uh, commentators at the end. But um, I just want to say that because we're trying to get the panels together, at each session, the uh, various name tags are going to be moving around a little bit um, so, so that we can get the panel together. So as you come back in, you, you may find your, your seat moved, uh, moved around. And keep in mind, if you are on a panel uh, or one of the presenters or a discussant at, at a future panel, you, you'll, you'll find your seating place up, up here at the front. I'll also note that since we are using um, interpreters, it's important that when you are speaking, you speak into the mic. When you're not speaking, either to ask a question or reading a paper or being a discussant or whatever, it would really help to keep the, the, the microphone off. Otherwise, we'll be creating a lot of background noise. So again, when somebody else is speaking and your mic is not in use, please be sure to, uh, 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 to leave it off. Also, because we are using interpreters, very important for those people who are speaking to speak into the mic and not to speak too quickly. Uh, I know I'm, I'm one of those individuals who does tend to speak too quickly, so I try to slow myself down and ask everybody else to, uh, to do the same. So for this morning's panel, we have two teams of presenters. In each team, and in the case of where we have individual uh, speakers, this will be true for the other panels, um, each paper at least is allotted 15 minutes. And then our discussants will each have 10 minutes to comment on the papers. And after those comments, each of the teams will again have about five minutes to, to respond if, if they wish to do so. Uh, if you've added all of that up as I went through it, you'll see that at the end we'll have probably close to an hour left, or hopefully that much left, for a general discussion around the room. And I'll be throwing it open to questions at that point. I'll try to remind people as they uh, approach their time limit and um, we'll look forward to keeping things at least more or less on schedule. So our first paper this morning is Diplomacy Before and After the Japanese, the, the Russo-Japanese War. It will be presented by David Shimopinik van der Oy and by Yasutoshi Teramoto. David Shimopinik van der Oy is Associate Professor of Russian and, e and East Asian History at Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario. His 1997 doctorate in Russian history is from Yale University, and he's been awarded fellowships from, from Harvard University's Olin Institute for, St for Strategic Studies, the National Humanities Centers, and the Social Science Research Council, as well as a Brock University Chancellor's Chair for Research Excellence. A specialist on Russian diplomatic history, he is the author of Toward the Rising Sun, Russian Ideologies of Empire and, and the Path to, to War with Japan, as well as of Oriental Dreams. Sorry, it's the same thing. So, same thing, okay, okay. Um, uh, Ideologies of Empire in Russia's Far East. D D David is currently working on a book about Russian Orientalism under contract with Yale University Press. Uh, the second presenter on the first paper is Yasutoshi Teramoto, who is a professor in the Faculty of Law at Hiroshima University. An expert in Japanese diplomatic history, particularly Japanese foreign policy during and after the Russo-Japanese War. 
He's the author of, and I'll read the title in translation rather than the original Japanese, Japanese Diplomacy Since the Russo-Japanese War, the Manchuria-Korea Problem in the, in the Context of Power Politics. I gather that uh, David will speak first for a few minutes, and then um, Termothi san will speak for about 10 minutes, and then back to David for a quick wrap up. Okay, David, please. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to thank very much Steve, Barry, and Alan for pulling this off. Um, we, uh, uh, a couple of us were here in 2002 um, and spent a, a lovely few days discussing uh, this uh, since we were also doing something similar. Um, so I'm, I'm very glad to, uh, to, to be here at last. Um, the other point I want to make uh, is, is, a, uh, uh, is a caveat. Um, I want to point out that the paper that you got um, is basically a combination of what uh, uh, Professor Terramoto and I wrote separately. Um, so um, it, it may not gel completely together yet. Um, and, and I apologize if, if in my efforts to keep the page limit under, I may have cut some things that uh, Professor Terramoto uh, considered uh, important. Um, what I want to do is to talk very briefly for five minutes about Russia's policy before 1905. Uh, Professor Teramoto uh, will then talk about Russia, will then talk about Japan before 1904-5 and after 1904-5, and I will conclude by talking about the policy after 1905. Um, now, the basic point of uh, the paper uh, that you have is. Um, is, is uh, to look at the diplomacy surrounding the Russo-Japanese War as an episode in the diplomacy of imperialism. Um, and um, I define the diplomacy of imperialism as sort of the ways that, the, the, the mechanism that informally the European great powers developed um, to avoid going to war over their interests um, overseas, um, their interests in Africa and in East Asia. Um, now, the term imperialism, of course, is a very is, is a very loaded one, uh, but I use it. Uh, I, I want to point out that 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 as a historian of late 19th century diplomacy, um, I use diplomacy, the term imperialism very clinically. It, it's to describe the period of great power expansion first in Africa and then in East Asia between roughly 1880 um, and the years just before World War I. So that is what I mean by imperialism, is great power expansion in Africa and in East Asia. Um, and the diplomacy that goes along with that was fairly effective um, until, of course, 1914. Um, uh, none of the great powers um, ever went to war. Uh, there were some near runs, there were some crises. Um, in Anglo-Russian rivalry in Central Asia led to some friction in Afghanistan um, in 1885 uh, and, and subsequently. Um, there was a, uh, a crisis when the, Briti when the French and the uh, British um, clashed at uh, Fashoda uh, in 1898, and there were, there were other crises, but these were always negotiated. Um, the problem um, with the origins of the Russo-Japanese War was that Russia, uh, Russian, Russia could not conceive of Japan as an equal uh, player in this game. Uh, and therefore, no matter how, uh, how considered, how patient, how reasonable Japanese diplomacy was, um, decision makers in, Russia, in St. Petersburg uh, could not adopt a, um, a, 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 an appropriate uh, line. Um, and I think the, the drawing, uh, the cartoon that's being distributed right now, I think shows very nicely uh, the Russian attitude towards Japan. Um, the drawing you see here, it's from a Russian satirical um, magazine, um, shows uh, a woman with a kokoshnik, a typical, you know, representing Russia. Um, and they're sitting around the table with all the other European powers. Um, and uh, she's serving tea. She's invited all the European powers to serve tea in a typical um, uh, living room. Uh, and the samovar uh, 
is inscribed international law. And the little boy who's being, uh, the, the naughty little boy who's being pulled by the ear um, is, is obviously Japan. So the point here is that Japan is a little child um, and should not want to um, you know, annoy the, the grown-ups. Um, but of course, Japan was not a little child um, in 1904-1905, uh, or, or at least in a decade before that. Um, the diplomacy, which I described much more um, uh, thoroughly in, in the paper, basically, consi basically uh, consisted uh, on the Russian side uh, of inconsistency, of confusion, and of vacillation. Um, the story is very complicated, but you can distill it into two very basic lines. Uh, on the one hand, there was the line that, which was advocated most forcefully by Russia's finance minister until 1903, Sergei Vita, who was really the architect of Russian expansion in East Asia, uh, beginning with the construction of the Siberian Railway in the early 1890s. And it was Sergei Vita uh, who advocated uh, what he called penetration pacifique, or peaceful penetration. In other words, uh, expansion to be sure, but through economic means, um, through railways, through banking, through commerce. Um, and the, for, for that to work successfully, you had to avoid military complications. Um, so he advocated a fairly moderate line um, in, in, in terms of diplomacy. But Arade against Vita was a shifting coalition of various people. Um, at one point, the Navy. At another point, the, for, the foreign minister in, 19, uh, in 1898. Um, and finally, a group that's sort of informally called the Biesobrazovci, uh, a shady entrepreneur uh, who would ultimately be eclipsed by a man named Alexeyev, Admiral Alexeyev, possibly the illegitimate son of Alexander II. Uh, but more importantly, um, he was uh, the Tsar's personal representative uh, beginning in summer 1903 um, in, in the Far East. Um, and these men all advocated a very hard line um, towards Japan. Uh, and therefore, uh, because of confused decision making, um, uh, Russians were never able to respond appropriately to uh, Japanese um, efforts, beginning really in 1896, to negotiate the so-called Mankan Kokan. Um, just as the West, as the great powers in the West were able to um, sort of negotiate relative spheres of influence, uh, Japan proposed to Russia very simply negotiating, and you can see this um, sort of on this map, uh, map number one, um, negotiating relative spheres um, with Korea falling in the Japanese sphere and Manchuria falling in the Russian sphere. Um, there were many Russians, uh, including the foreign minister, Lambsdorff from uh, 1900, um, who thought that this would be a good idea and this was entirely reasonable. Uh, but there were others who thought that no, uh, as in his drawing, Japan was just a naughty little boy uh, and should not play along with the grown-ups. And I'll shut up now um, and turn the floor over to Teramoto-san. Now, as far as the portion that I will be handling, I will be speaking about uh, Japan's diplomacy vis-à-vis uh, -vis before and after the Russo-Japanese War. I will be concentrating on Japanese diplomacy pre and post the Russo-Japanese War. Now, first of all, the Boxers' Rebellion was a major turning point. Prior to that point, Japanese diplomacy had to do primarily with interests in, on the Korean Peninsula vis-à-vis -vis the Qing dynasty. That said, with Japan becoming victorious after the, in the Russo-Japanese War, Russia began to look at acquiring points on the real Don Peninsula, such as Port Arthur and, and Dalian. And this is why Japan needed to fight Russia rather than 
the Qing Dynasty over interests on the Korean Peninsula. But that was before the Boxers Rebellion. After Boxers, the Manchurian issue emerges. Let me speak about Japan's diplomacy, its basic uh, diplomacy, starting with the Boxers' Rebellion all the way to the bre breakout of the Russo-Japanese War. Katsura Taro, or Taro Katsura, was the uh, prime minister back in those days. And he has stated that Russia has occupied Manchuria, but that is not the, their final position. They would eventually go south and enter Korea. This was the thinking that he had. Consequently, even if we were to join hands with Russia and have a, a treaty, this would be only temporary. Ultimately, Russia will certainly pressure Japan with its force, and Japan would, uh, would be defeated. Now, as far as Great Britain, they were fighting in, in South Africa. They were somewhat isolated in Europe as well. So their policy was to hold off on expansion. They wanted to maintain the status quo. That was their basic approach. And hence, the, the idea was to join hands with Great Britain. However, the, Komura, Jutaro Komura was the key person in the cabinet of Taro Katsura, and this was a man who had a rather expansive view of diplomacy. For example, as we proceed diplomacy, he spoke about the importance of looking at internal affairs, uh, trade. He had a much more comprehensive view of diplomacy. For example, um, mines, uh, forestry, railways, these were considered by him to be extremely important rather than limiting himself to diplomatic negotiations. He had a much more comprehensive view. First of all, the most ideal, as David mentioned, um, was to do a Mankan exchange. That is, Manchuria would belong to, to uh, Russia and Korea would belong to Japan. However, as time went on, it became clear that swapping those two territories was rather difficult. Korea was considered by him to be a break or make. As far as Manchuria, uh, he was more ambivalent, could go either way. So based on the idea that Korea, we could not give in on Korea, diplomacy uh, was uh, formulated, diplomatic policy was formulated. At that time, the question of whether we should join hands with Russia or whether we should uh, go into an alliance with Great Britain, there were two possibilities. As Katsura had stated, even if we were to join hands with Russia, ultimately uh, this would be only a temporary solution in the Far East. Also, as far as the Qing dynasty, is concerned, they weren't too happy about it because they would have to allow Russia's presence there. There's also a possibility of having to fight the uh, British na Navy. And this is why uh, the decision was made to go with uh, an Anglo-Japanese alliance. According to Kumataro Honda, who was uh, Komura's secretary, it is said that Komura always had in mind a war with Russia. And this is why, as foreign minister, he was, he participated in the Katsura cabinet and, and, and worked towards the uh, entering uh, uh, into with Great Britain of the alliance. So this was all building up uh, to the Russo-Japanese war. That was a thinking that uh, Komura had, according to Honda, 
to borrow Hana's words, the Manchurian issue and the Korean issue are inseparable. And war with Russia is inevitable. These were, were the words used. Now, there was also Hirobumi Ito, uh, who was quite influential. Unlike Kom Komura and Katsura, Ito believed that in order to resolve the Manchuria and the Korean issues, we would need to talk with Russia. Because if we spoke with, with Great Britain, we would eventually have to fight Russia. Uh, he was also fearful of Russia's na naval force, and so Ito valued the ability to negotiate with Russia. So uh, there was this diversion, uh, divergence of view. The similarity uh, was that they both uh, considered Korea to be of, of primary importance, and it was and Manchuria was important in that context. And now, uh, the process that led to the Russo-Japanese War, in 1903, uh, one year uh, before the war, an imperial conference was held in June with the presence of the emperor. There, there's a, there's a Murian meeting that was held at the private residence of uh, Admiral Yamagata. And a determination was made at this point to uh, go, go into war. That said, it was just a resolution. Uh, and the will was still there to negotiate a peace. And this had to do with the fact that the cabinet members weren't too com comfortable with the, uh, the military power of Japan. Now, post Russo Japanese War, what, ha what happened to our diplomacy? The, the, when you look at international politics around that time, there was no doubt that the focus wa was on, on Europe. That said, there was another sphere that was created by, by forces that were between Japan and the United States. And I believe this second focus is important when we try to look at, understand the world at that time. Japanese uh, diplomacy focused both on Europe and Asia, had a two-pronged approach. Subsequent to the Russo-Japanese Russo War, I believe there were three approaches. First, had to do with creating a military regime in Manchuria, this is the Imperial Army of Japan, uh, have a, basically a, this was a Komura approach of imperialism. And the other was to maintain the status quo, Hayashi Tadatsu uh, approach. So these were the approaches. Now, what was the significance of hmm? So Japan fought China and then Russia, and it came to, after the Russo-Japanese War, control Manchuria in addition to Korea. So this was in violation of the previous commitments made by Japan. So Japan goes into Manchuria, and a couple of decades later, rather, so, so thank you. Uh, I will be very brief. Um, the main point of 
post-war diplomacy uh, from the Russian perspective was that it was much more straightforward than pre-war diplomacy. Um, <coughs> Russia, like Japan, of course, was militarily and financially exhausted, but it was also politically exhausted. There, was, there were the events of Bloody Sunday, um, revolution uh, for the very first time uh, in Russian history, um, all three oppositional elements, uh, the peasantry, uh, the urban masses, and the intelligentsia all joined against the autocracy. Uh, the autocracy blinked uh, and um, accorded a, uh, a legislature. Um, so <coughs> the diplomacy of the new foreign minister, uh, Alexander Izvolsky, uh, he had a relatively brief tenure because he, 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 he mucked up rather spectacularly uh, within two years of his uh, term. Uh, in the Balkans, but uh, his, his diplomacy when he came to office in 1906 can best be described as recueillement redux, which is a fancy way of saying um, move slowly, of uh, don't offend anybody on your borders and concentrate on your uh, internal uh, peace and internal reconstruction. Uh, and for Izvolsky, uh, who by the way had been Russian minister to Japan a few years earlier, uh, in the Far East, um, that meant um, just basically um, with disengage uh, and um, not withdraw, but at least disengage and avoid all possible <coughs> conflicts. Um, as, as Bruce, I think, will mention later on, um, he was, of course, his geopolitical in interests were more focused on the Balkans, uh, but very clearly he wanted to establish peace in, in East Asia. Um, and um, well, the outcome of this relatively intelligent assessment of Russia's at least specific needs was rather than fighting Japan, um, was to join it. Um, and that concluded in the Russo-Japanese Convention of July 30th, 1907, um, whose secret codicils basically, uh, as the second map on your handout shows, um, accorded to Russia, uh, Outer Mongolia and Manchuria, uh, and to Japan, um, uh, 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 southern Manchuria um, and Korea. Uh, and uh, I will just, I think probably the easiest thing is just to read the final paragraph, um, uh, which basically wraps it up, at least from my point of view. If Nicholas's dysfunctional Far Eastern diplomacy was an, was a con an important contributing factor, the basic cause of the Russo-Japanese war was St. Petersburg's inability to take seriously Tokyo as a legitimate player in the imperialist game. It would take the fall of Mukden and the sinking of the Baltic fleet at Tsushima to convince Russians to take Japan seriously. And as the relatively smooth course of the negotiations after Portsmouth indicate, in the island empires, i.e. Japan's imperialist pretensions, were now seen as legitimate by the Russians. In the coming years, Russia and Japan would be the most aggressive and enthusiastic beneficiaries of the Qing Dynasty's agony. The economic development of northern Manchuria continued apace, and in 1912, Mongolia became a Tsarist protectorate. Thus, far from losing its imperial appetites in East Asia after 1905, St. Petersburg continued to pursue ambitions, although, albeit on a more restricted scale, and only now it did so with rather than against Japan. That's it. Okay. <laughs> First of all, I want to th uh, uh, th uh, th thank our two presenters and turn now to our second paper, uh, which is entitled Lessons, L Lessons Lessened. A little bit of a tongue twister there. <laughs> the Russian Military Legacy of 1904-05. And this paper is by Bruce Menning and John Steinberg. Bruce Menning, who received his PhD in, Russia, in, in history from Duke University, is a professor of military strategy with the Department of Joint and Multinational Operations at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. A specialist in Russian history and in Russian, Soviet, and post-Soviet military history and strategy, Professor Menning has spent extensive periods carrying out research in Russian and Soviet archives and has held grants and fellowships from a number of organizations, 
including the International Research and Exchanges Board, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Ford Foundation, and the Social Science Research Council. He is the author of numerous articles and of the book, Bayonets Before Bullets, the, Im the Imperial Russian Army, 1861 to 1914. His co-presenter, John Steinberg, who received his PhD from Ohio State University, is Associate Professor of History at George Georgia Southern University. He, he has also been a Fulbright Professor of Russian History at Helsinki University and was trained as an instructor of strategy, tactics, and doctrine by the United States Air Force. His research focuses on the history of the Imperial Russian Army. Along with Professors Menning and, and, and Shimo Penik van der Oy, <coughs> as well as two other participants in our conference, David Wolf and Shinji Yokote, he compiled and edited the Russo-Japanese War in Global Perspective, World War Zero. He has published several articles on the Imperial Army and has recently com completed a manuscript on the education, training, and performance of the Russian General Staff. Thank you, Barry. Um, I think I should say that one of the contributors to our collection is Barry. <laughs> uh, and uh, I want to thank him and Steve and Alan and also Ron Edsforth for putting forth the effort to, to as, I li as I told my wife as I was leaving for the last campaign of the Russo-Japanese War, <laughs> 100th anniversary <laughs> celebration. Um, when we come to the uh, question of lessons lessened, uh, you can imagine, first, first of all, I have to say it's, it's kind of a clumsy process for historians to co-write articles. I've never done one, and, and well, Bruce and I were burning up the wires, so to speak, between uh, Tennessee, where I live on the weekends, and uh, Kansas, and uh, trying to divide responsibilities, it, it's, it's, it's messy. And, and so, I, like uh, Shemmel Penick van der Oy was saying over there, this is a work in, in progress, and we're really very much looking forward to responses we get for direction in, in concluding it. Um, so when it came time to put together a presentation, uh, uh, Bruce said to me, well, look, we're going to deal with lessons lessened, and you need to put together the broad landscape so I can dig a deep hole. <laughs> and so in putting together the broad <laughs> landscape, I, uh, I, I really, you know, lessons lessened came down to we have to learn what needs to be learned, and then we have to fix the problem. And in fixing the problem, what we're dealing with is the question of reform. Ah, now, to the broad landscape and reform in Russian history, and may I say the landscape is very broad. If you break down Russian history into the history of reigns of rulers, you can easily go back to Ivan the Terrible and work your way forward and note how each reign deals with this question of providing Russia with the financial and administrative means to wage war. Now, where I'm going to pick up this story is with the early 19th century, uh, with Nicholas I, who's considered an arch reactionary. But there is a body of literature out there, mainly by a historian named W. Bruce Lincoln, that says while he's being an arch reactionary, he is training a whole co cohort of bureaucrats who become the reformers of the reign of Alexander II. And the reformer who we must pay attention to when it comes to military matters and late imperial history is none other than the war minister D.A. Milyutin. Milyutin will reform the Russian military establishment unlike anybody before him or after him, at least in the imperial period. We can argue about the, the Soviet period. And so trying to explain Milyutin's goals in 38 seconds boils down to three central goals in my, to my way of thinking. Uh, the first one was to centralize the military establishment into the, shall we say, broad reaching arms of the war ministry. It became a highly centralized institution, making the war minister all powerful. Uh, the, the second thing he does is he modernizes the education and training establishment of the Imperial Army with the eye towards creating, and, and this was his word, a meritocracy among officer corps. 
uh, among officers within the officer corps. And this, this was a per perhaps, well, I can't say it's the biggest thing because the third thing that he does is introduce uh, universal military conscription, which arguably is even bigger. But in trying to create a meritocracy, what he's doing is he's breaking up the, the old way of advancement within the officer corps. And he's trying to get, shall we say, the cream to rise to the top and get the best people in the positions they need to be in for Russia to wage war. Well, you know, uh, I think even uh, uh, a school child knows that uh, the way this all ends, this period of reform, is with the assassination of Alexander II. And we have the brief reign of Alexander III, which is usually noted for being a period of counter-reform. And the longer I read on this period, I'm not sure if that's correct. It's something aimed at the way Alexander II met his demise. But nonetheless, uh, Alexander III has a war minister, uh, P.A. Vanovsky, who does his best to halt the progress of, if I can use this word, the democratization of the officer corps within the army. But modernization has a funny way of moving forward regardless of what traditional, perhaps even superannuated military leaders want to accomplish. And so he's never quite able to accomplish that but while he is working towards uh, counter-reforming educational processes, what I would argue is, is that he, the military establishment, cannot keep pace. It's not that they're unaware, but they cannot keep pace with the rapidly changing battlefield environment of this age of imperialism, as my colleagues previously pointed out. And what I'm talking about here is it's getting really expensive to wage war. The Russians know what's going on around them, but they can't afford to modernize at the rate of the great European powers who set the benchmark. Okay, and this is how they go on to the Asian battlefield in 1904-05. I would argue that, well, as, as, uh, as my colleagues just pointed out, the Russians really are not ready to wage war. They don't understand the enemy that they are going to encounter and uh, uh, they're not prepared to wage war. And so if you look at it in these terms, it's not at all surprising what happens to them out in, uh, in Northeast Asia or in Manchuria in 1904-05, which leads me to the part I've been waiting for, and it's, it boils down to, it's 1905, it's October. Uh, the pressing question is that if an Asian nation can defeat Russia, what can the European powers do? The need to reform is as urgent as it was in 1861 when Milyutin became war minister. And the need to reform is all encompassing. Because of the disaster in Manchuria, the Russians have to look at the world and say, bureaucratically, administratively, we failed. And also on the level of war fighting capabilities, we failed. And we must do something. We must do something rapidly. We must do it now. And I think that's my allotted time. Good luck. Oops. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. I, 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 I'm almost at a loss for words knowing that I've got seven minutes and 30 seconds to talk like the old FedEx commercials. Um, what strikes me in approaching the subject uh, in the broadest sense at first is uh, going back to a saying that I think uh, everyone attributes to Hemingway is that what you have to do is write one true sentence. And I think in looking at the period, especially at the period that unfolded uh, between 1905 and roughly late 1908, late 1909 in Russia, uh, that I think I'd, s I'd write that one true sentence something like this, that the Grand Duke Nicholas Nikolaevich had a rendezvous with, had a rendezvous with destiny, but for a variety of reasons he failed to show up. Uh, and going beyond that, looking at uh, why that was so and how the lessons learned translated into reform process actually unfolded, 
Uh, yesterday I was reading an article, I can't remember in which newspaper anymore, in which uh, the author of the article talked about the way that large organizations uh, behave when they confront catastrophe. And I don't think that the case in point was uh, Hurricane Katrina in this instance, but it was really a medical, uh, a medical scandal that occurred in Australia. And the author said, well, uh, the first part of the process is, uh, number one is denial, deny the facts. Number two, uh, bury the evidence. And number three, shoot the messenger. Uh, and what happened was the, the failure in the Far East was of such proportions and so clear to everyone that you couldn't deny the facts, you couldn't bury the evidence, although they buried and sunk a lot of it in the Far East. Uh, and shooting the messenger doesn't become uh, the method of operation until Stalin. Uh, so what happens is that the Russians are confronted with, with uh, realigning uh, restructuring their overall strategy, their imperial strategy. Uh, part of that realignment says that we have to refocus our attention from the Far East uh, to Europe, to the concerns and problems more primarily of European Russia, and that's something that uh, that the uh, foreign policy papers I think point out relatively well. Um, the second thing is, and although this is not the way that, uh, that the Tsarist authorities saw the problem in all its ramifications, but that was to rethink how they went about formulating and implementing an overall strategy. And at the Staff College, we have a shorthand definition of strategy, which really uh, is simple enough and broad enough to fit most circumstances that one is confronted with, and that says that strategy is the linking or orga uh, orchestration and linking of ends, ways, and means. Uh, ends, ways, and means have to be defined and they have to be harmonized, they have to be brought into congruence to bring about effective outcomes. And essentially what happened for the Russians was that in the post-1905 period, they did a pretty fair job of redefining their ends. Uh, that is to reprioritize uh, their foreign policy and security objectives, to refocus on Europe and uh, the relations with Europe. And that's broadly conceived, by the way, meaning Europe all the way from the Straits uh, up to Finland. Uh, but where they ran into problems, uh, that is where the Russians ran into problems, was trying to redefine uh, and find uh, ways and means. Means were very scarce. They had no money. The treasury was essentially empty. They're living on uh, old budgets and essentially, in by 1906, French loans. And so the question comes to be then, given all of that, what do we do in support of foreign policy in support of foreign policy objectives uh, on, uh, from the side of the armed forces. And in order to confront this problem, the, the post or the 1905 and close period following 1905 sees the evolution of institutions, new organizations that are designed to do this, primarily uh, the State Defense Council and uh, beyond the State Defense Council, uh, the Army Ground Forces General Staff, and then the Naval General Staff. The idea is that these institutions will harmonize the development of policies so that we get away from the kinds of mistakes that led us into the problems in the Far East. And uh, e essentially the key figure in this, and coming back to my original uh, assertion, is the grand, uh, beyond the Tsar himself, is the Grand Duke Nicholas Nikolaevich. And for all kinds of reasons that we point out in the paper, uh, neither he nor the organizations live up to their promise. Uh, and the most evident manifestation of not living up to promise is, the, is, you know, to put it in colloquial terms, the food fight that occurs between the Army and the Navy over uh, who gets what scarce resources. And what was amazing to me as I parsed through these materials, this is essentially a work in progress, uh, 
uh, most of my life I've spent looking at Russian and Soviet ground forces and have paid attention only to the Navy as a, oh, that's a curiosity. Uh, and then suddenly hitting me right, right square in the face is the fact that in 1907, what happened was uh, we see a resurgence of the same kind of navalism, nearly the same kind of navalism that had helped lead Russia down the crooked path to ruin in the Far East, reasserting its er ugly head under a different guise and distorting all of those prior or beginning to distort all those priorities over all over again. Uh, and not only that, but bringing about the death of the State Defense Council and severely proscribing what will be the continuing activities of both the ground forces and naval, naval forces general staffs. Uh, and if you want to get to the bottom line in this, uh, what does it mean for the period after 1908 and 1909? What it means is that you will essentially go back to the same kind of compartmentalization uh, that accompanies the development over of overarching strategies and so on in the pre-1904 period, somewhat chastened on the basis of lessons learned, yes, uh, but nonetheless the major aspects of it are still there. Uh, and in addition to that, what you will see is the ground forces will end up going to war in 1914 on the basis of scarce resources. Oh, by the way, uh, we spent the money that you needed for fortress modernization for the construction of strategic railroads and for the acquisition of heavy artillery. We spent that money on the new dreadnought uh, uh, battle squadron that we laid down for uh, essentially what would be a useless mission in the Baltic. So. Uh, there's an interesting way. I know that history doesn't repeat itself, uh, but there's an interesting way in which you see a number of the factors that helped lead to the problems in the Far East uh, repeating themselves in a certain way under a different guise, under different circumstances in the post-1905 period. Thank you very much. If I th thank you. Uh, I'll now introduce uh, both our discussants and then let, uh, let them speak. And again, our discussants, we each take about 10 minutes, and then each of the uh, panelists have a, a couple of minutes uh, to respond. Our discussants are, first of all, uh, Carol Iokibi, who is Associate Professor at Tokyo Metropolitan University, a specialist in Japanese political history. He was a research associate in the Faculty of Law at Tokyo University between 1996 and 1999 and was lecturer until, until 2001. His works include Okuma Shigenobo and po Party Politics, Origins of the Multi-Party System, 1881 to 1914. He is currently writing a book on a revision of unequal treaties during the Meiji er era. Jennifer Siegel, who received her PhD from Yale, is assistant professor of history at Ohio State University, where she specializes in modern European and diplomatic history with a focus on the Russian and British empires. She has received a number of prestigious fellowships, including an Olin Postdoctoral Fellowship and a Mellon Foundation Dissertation Fellowship. Among her other publications, Professor Siegel is the author of Endgame, Britain, Russia, and the Final Struggle, Struggle for Central Asia, which received the, the, the 2003 Barbara Jelavitz Prize from the, from the American Association for the Advancement of Slavic Studies. I think we decided that I would actually speak first. I'd like to begin by thanking uh, our four panelists, authors, for the very interesting papers that we had a chance to read. It seems to me that there is one clear common theme that stretches across both of these papers, across the challenges of the pre- and post-war diplomatic and military planning and strategy, and that is Confusion, confusion, lack of coordination, lack of communication within ministries, across governments, in the international domain. The picture that has been painted by these two papers is one of policy that is not unified, not for the Russians in their pre-war diplomacy or in their post-war military planning and not for the Japanese in their post-war diplomatic strategy. The question, of course, is why? Why, for example, were the Russians so incapable of formulating 
and implementing a discernible Far East policy in the early years of the 20th century. As David and Teremoto-san have shown us, on the one hand, the answer lies in the conflicting personalities and agendas of the men who were in charge, or perhaps the men who were competing to be in charge, the men who produced what we've read Komuro describe as the, quote, serious diversity of opinion in the councils of Russia. With Vita and Lambsdorff knocking skulls with Bezobrazov and his gang, all trying to gain the confidence of what I think our panelists called the pathologically indecisive Nicholas, was Russian policy doomed to disorder? Similarly, in the post-war period, with three simultaneous lines of diplomacy competing for control over the future path of Japanese foreign policy, could Japan possibly present to its friends and its potential foes a clearly discernible policy and position? In the pre-war period, According to our two authors, Japan's aims and demands in the Far East were clear. And their methods were diplomatic, not necessarily military. An alliance with Great Britain was Kimura's solution for the Manchurian-Korean question. But Japan's post-war diplomacy was much more muddled. There is a real shift that occurred, perhaps during the course of the war, perhaps during its aftermath. Russian policy pre-war was conflicted and muddled. In comparison, Tsarist policy post-war was, as David has described it, relatively single-minded. Japan's policy pre-war was focused, determined, clear, but post-war, it is the Japan of the Katsura and Sayanji cabinets that is ambivalent and somewhat perplexing. And it would seem from the two case studies that we have in the paper, the Russo-Japanese War and as uh, Taramoto-san has suggested, the Second World War in the Pacific, which is a direct result of the shift in Japanese orientation, according to Taramoto-san, from Europe across the Pacific to the United States in the aftermath of the Treaty of Portsmouth. This confusion, this competition between policy lines can have disastrous effects, directly contributing to the origins and outbreak of military conflicts. But my key question to our panelists is, is why? Why does this shift take place, this shift between uh, focus and confusion and vice versa. Is it the war? The specific experiences of the war, the experiences for the victors and for the losers alike that produced this shift? Is this shift the result of more general experiences in wartime or simply the natural response to the outbreak and challenges of war? Or perhaps, and specifically because we are here, of course, commemorating the signing of the treaty. Is it the details of the Portsmouth Treaty itself, the agreement that was hammered out, that produces this somewhat marked reversal in the methodological orientation of both combatant governments? Or maybe the experience in Portsmouth, the experiences of the diplomatic game played out here in New Hampshire that impacted the future policies of Japan and Russia, the lessons, correct or otherwise, of the diplomacy of the war and the diplomacy of forging the peace. Perhaps that is what has influenced this shift. And speaking of lessons, let me turn for a few minutes, and I know I've only got a few minutes. There's nothing worse than a discussant who talks for longer than the panelists. I promise not to be that person. Let me turn to the very interesting paper that Bruce and John have given us. Again, in the Russian military planning response to the Russo-Japanese War, we get a picture that is painfully similar to the Russian practices on the diplomatic side before the war. We see policies being discussed and competing for implementation 
policies that lack an overall view of the big picture, a long-term understanding concept of Russia's needs, potential and immediate. Guiden, as we read in the paper, may have felt that Russia's greatest need was the unified direction of foreign and military policy. But as John and Bruce have shown us, Russia could not even agree on the structures that would allow for the construction of that policy, let alone agree on the policies themselves. And of course, the authors of the second paper see the fault lying in exactly the same place that the authors of our first paper do, the pathologically indecisive Nicholas, and of course, in Nicholas's appointments. Clearly, the Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich was not the right man for the job. Bruce has made that very clear. Nor was he surrounded by a properly balanced team that would have enabled him to coordinate the planning and long-term strategy for both ground and naval forces together. The result was a short-lived, ineffectual military planning apparatus that to borrow a phrase from John and Bruce's description of Russia's ground forces during the war, lurched from small defeats to large defeats. <laughs> now the picture that we get, of course, in both of these papers, the picture that we get of Russian policy is a rather sad one. What we have here are two examples of Russian attempts to devise and implement policy. The pre-war example, the diplomatic example, exists in an era when Russia was lacking even the pretense of united government. The military example of the post-war period, however, comes at a time when the purported emphasis was on the coordination and cooperation of all the branches of government, not just all the branches of the military, but neither system, neither the pre-war nor post-war systems produced a unified, clearly discernible, and effective policy. The question remains, of course, why? A question you all will answer, not me. More to the point, drawing on, I hope you all will answer it, drawing on the themes both of these papers have presented, is the reason, is, is Russia doomed to failure because of a serious deficiency in terms of its personnel. Is that the problem? Or is it just that Russia continually failed to take away from their military and diplomatic experiences the right lessons? That Russia failed to ask the right questions and failed to implement the correct policies in response to the answers to those questions? Now, briefly, before I wrap up, I'm going to exercise the discussant's prerogative and just throw out one last thought, because I can, and because I'm running out of time. I think one of the most interesting ideas and in the questions that comes out of the first paper is that, of, is that idea of the importance of perceptions in the diplomatic game and in the making of foreign policy. And of course, by extension, we can see this vitally in the importance of military planning as well, the importance of perceptions. And this, of course, was the main thrust of David's final concluding paragraph. It is extremely important and interesting to note the difficulties of diplomacy when perceptions of the other do not coincide with the other's perceptions of itself. What we see in the first paper is a situation in which perceptions misperceptions and expectations dangerously impact the policy planning of the various participants. Russia's perceptions of Japan as a non-Western and therefore, in their eyes, inferior and backwards nation, in stark contrast with the vivid pictures of a Japan steeped in modernity that we saw last night in all of those fabulous postcards, these misperceptions led the Russians not to negotiate in earnest, not to apply the rules of the diplomacy of imperialism to their rivals in the Far East, not in fact to see them as realistic rivals at all. 
Obviously, this was not a good idea. And similarly, as this paper suggests, Japan's growing perceptions of the United States in the aftermath of the Russo-Japanese War as their principal competitor for Far Eastern hegemony hinges on the idea, the perception, that the United States was, in fact, an Asian power, not so much a European one, that the United States saw its destiny in the Pacific, not the Atlantic, in some ways echoing Russia's great 19th century debate, is Russia Europe or Asia, East or West? So if Japan's answer to the variant of the question, is the United States Europe or Asia, East or West, if Japan's answer is the, that the United States is East, this perception is going to greatly impact the geopolitical maneuvers that follow, no matter what the long-term agenda that the United States actually had in the Far East. And this, I think, is one of the interesting questions which I would love to hear more about. Now, with these thoughts, I am going to stop and allow uh, my colleague to have the floor, and I do hope I've left enough time for the panelists to answer not only my questions, but yours as well. Yes, my name is Iko I'd like to speak about what well, I have been recently uh, researching in 19th century diplomacy, primarily on, on equal treaties that uh, been entered into. We have had um, Ms. Zigo uh, cover a wide range of issues, so let me talk about uh, Japan proper. What was, how was the Russo-Japanese war perceived in Japan? And ask some questions. First of all, referring you to the paper written by Mr. Teramoto and, uh, and David Schmelpenick, they both uh, highlighted the, the differences that existed pre and post war. Professor Teramoto spoke about how after the war, there was a new focus created in the Far East that focused on, on Asia. Prior to the war, it was power politics uh, focused on Europe. But post-war, there was this very small sphere, and yet international political center that was created. Also, Dr. Shmopinik also mentioned how Russia uh, underestimated uh, Japan, and that led to their demise. For continuity, con continuity's sake, if I could ask you the following question. Dr. Smelpinik, I have a question for you. Dip diplomacy that leads to war, when we talk about that, time is an important factor in that. In the case of Japan, how do we, I think Japan's issue is how do we go about this short-term advantage that we have militarily? And Japan uh, did not really fully utilize this. It was a failure, and the Pacific War was a much uh, a greater failure, a failure in a greater scale, on a greater scale. So we, we had the Satsuma and Choshu uh, clans uh, who were against the Bakugu. And uh, Taro Katsura was considered to be its heir. And there were also political parties. And in 1894, uh, parliament was created. And these political parties attacked these anti-government based on the unequal treaties that were created. And this resulted in the Sino-Japanese War of 1894. しかし、え、
反発政府はその正当性を維持したわけであります。したがって日露戦争開戦時には日本は軍事的な優位にはありましたけれども、そのやり方が失敗したんですね。そのやり方が失敗したんですね。そのやり方が失敗したんですね。そのやり方が失敗したんですね。そのやり方が失敗したんですね。そのやり方が失敗したんですね。そのやり方が失敗したんですね。そのやり方が失敗したんですね。そのやり方が失敗したんですね。そのやり方が失敗したんですね。そのやり方が失敗したんですね。戦後も同様でありまして、日本は一時的に勝利し、優位に立っているけれども、いつかロシアの方が日本側は非常に大きな勝利をしています。ですから、戦前も戦後も一時的な優位をどう使うかという問題に日本は進めています。このロシアが大きな勝利をしています。このロシアが大きな勝利をしています。このロシアが大きな勝利をしています。このロシアが大きな勝利をしています。このロシアが大きな勝利をテラモト先生に対するご質問は、国際政治の性質に関わるものであります。And for Professor Teramoto, I have a question regarding international politics. Before the war, there was awareness in Japan that the international politics had changed even prior to the Russo-Japanese war. Rather than temporary treaties, alliances that were beginning to be born. Uh, were considered to be the reflection of the pride of the peoples. For example, the Franco Russo uh, alliance. Uh, there were visits paid by uh, Russian fleets and, and French fleets visiting each other's ports. And eventually, uh, World War I broke out after the breakout of these uh, alliances. And this is, we can understand that the Anglo Japanese alliance was considered to be something to be proud of, and this was considered not to be a temporary arrangement. Professor Teramoto talked about how diplomacy after war had somewhat changed. Japan, Russian, and Taunt was an important uh, arrangement, but it was not a, a treaty. There's Katsura Root uh, Agreement that, uh, that had individual names that were temporary agreements, and if there was any change in government, there was no guarantee that these uh, agreements would be honored. So there was a difference in the nature of the uh, Politics, international politics in, in East Asia and international politics in, in Europe. And referring you now to the papers presented by uh, Professor Steinberg and Professor Many. If you try to come up with an organization that would put together the fragmented organization, it seems like there's a paradox uh, that is pointed out in the paper that caused further fragmentation and compartmentalization. What was interesting with the Russo-Japanese War was that Control was was uh, in the hands of individuals such as the Grand Duke Nikolaevich, and this was a war that was fought between uh, two imperial powers, or the monarch. After the war, the State Defense Council and Duma were created, and so there was decentralization or, or multiple centers created within the government. And the question I have is whether Nicholas II, this is in fact the question that I'm most interested in finding out, whether there was no change in the awareness on the part of the emperor because of all these changes that occurred. In Japan, it was not possible that, uh, to even conceive that the emperor would play the kind of role played by Nic Nicholas II. In, the, in younger days, the Japanese emperor apparently had thought about this possibility, but in the 1880s, the emperor uh, succumbed to the pressure exerted by Hirobumi Ito. What was fortunate for Russia is the constitutional monarch was created, 
Parliament so these two, two parties that were against is at one point contemplated doing away with the constitution uh, still uh, honor the position of the emperor. Correction, the emperor actually did not allow for the uh, doing away of the constitution even when these uh, two parties uh, had uh, asserted that. Uh, I just want to, want to remind uh, all the presenters and people who are asking questions that when you speak, try not to speak too closely into the mic. We've been getting a little bit of feedback on the recording, so try to hold back a little bit. I know the temptation is to lean forward a little, uh, 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 quite, clo quite close to the microphone. Um, now I'd like to turn to the panelists and see if they have any, uh, any comments or re responses, responses to, the, to, the, to the comments. <laughs> I'll go first. <laughs> uh, just very briefly, um, uh, I just wanted to uh, underline, uh, well, I won't answer, but uh, point out that um, Yokibe-san raises a very interesting question when he says that time really complicates diplomacy, the perception that if you don't act now, um, the, game, the jig will be up. Uh, and of course, the parallel to that are the American-Japanese negotiations before uh, Pearl Harbor, where again, uh, on the Japanese side, there's a real perception that if we don't act now, we'll have no more oil, uh, and therefore all our losses will be eviscerated. Um, but um, maybe over drinks, um, much longer we can sort of ruminate about the question of time, which is, and I thank you for that. Thank you very much for uh, valuable comments. As to uh, my, uh, the, my comment about uh, uh, Professor Siegel's uh, comments, uh, you, you talked about misperception. And I, I think that, uh, that is a serious problem uh, for the Russo Japanese war as well. In the contemporary war, uh, uh, Professor Irie uh, is a specialist uh, 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 there, there was a serious uh, perception uh, gap in the uh, Russo Japanese uh, uh, war as well. Uh, there were many things, but in the end, whichever attitude uh, uh, Russia took, they wanted to occupy uh, Manchuria and uh, uh, near the uh, Korean border, uh, they were doing uh, various uh, suspicious activities. The Japanese uh, side uh, thought, uh, so they felt like uh, they had to resort to a war. On the other hand, in Russia, as uh, uh, Professor Schmidt mentioned, uh, they didn't have uh, established or unified uh, perception. And so perception gap uh, is always a cause uh, for a conflict in any uh, time, any age. And Professor Yokibe talked about uh, post pre and post uh, uh, war uh, continuity and uh, uh, this continuity. 
diplomacy. That's a very important uh, aspect. Uh, I'm a diplom diplomacy specialist. Uh, so, uh, uh, three countries in intervention uh, related to uh, uh, Tadashi, Tadashi Hayashi, Hayashi, and he became uh, the foreign minister. And uh, he asked, uh, he received uh, the uh, notice uh, from uh, uh, the other uh, uh, European powers uh, to return the Alayan Don Peninsula. But uh, Japan felt he felt that the Japan had, shouldn't be isolated, and so they were looking for an alliance. And uh, it was uh, uh, true to uh, pre-war uh, Japan as well. The common thing after the Russo-Japanese War was that the, even if Japan was a winner, um, if uh, we looked at uh, U.S., uh, U.K., or Russia, and Japan wasn't still uh, confident about itself. So gradually, uh, Japan wanted to strengthen uh, its alliance with uh, Russia, as was uh, mentioned vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, U.S. Uh, Takahiro Root uh, agreement was uh, just a policy agreement, a uh, tem temporary agreement. But uh, under the uh, situation when uh, the uh, Japanese-American relationship uh, deteriorated. The Japanese uh, uh, relationship with Russia was uh, uh, improved. So this continuity was, as I mentioned, the focus was a change from Korea to Manchuria. And so there was a very uh, a discontinuity, I would say. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank our commentators for their comments. And, you know, it strikes me that uh, Professor Siegel gives us the pathologically indecisive Nicholas II. And Professor. Oh, sh oh, I should blame that on Schimmel Panic. Uh, uh, and and uh, Professor Yokobe, Yokibe, pardon me. Um, he asked this interesting question, the, does the war change Nicholas II in his thinking, essentially? And uh, trying to stick to the broad, since that seems to be what I was assigned here. Um, if you look at the historiography of Nicholas II, it's, it really is a fascinating thing. I, I kind of wish Professor Levin, Dominic Levin, was here, because we all know he'd have something to say as well. Um, and what, what I want to bring out of this, what I'm trying to bring out of this is, is that as we were writing this paper and talking on the telephone, we really got hung up with Nicholas II. We got hung up with him because Bruce, through his digging, comes up with this anomaly that when it comes to these important budgetary decisions in the post-Russo-Japanese war period, Nicholas is always siding with the Navy. And the anomaly is, is that Nicholas was trained as an army officer uh, and was very proud of his, his background in the army and would make a big deal out of it, but somewhere he becomes a navalist. And it's not really well, uh, uh, well defined in the historiography, which goes to show, and I don't think any of us should be surprised by this, that despite the fact that this was a very public man in, in terms of uh, when he was alive, uh, we knew what he looked like, we knew what he sounded like, we, we knew how he acted, uh, and then after his tragic death and a uh, period of time, uh, emergence of all sorts of papers and, and diaries, and, and the answer to their question really is, is that we're still stuck with this paradigm, that we don't have an answer, uh, and that we have to keep working at it. And so uh, I see Bruce is ready to grab the microphone there, so I'll, I'll let him have it. <laughs> thanks, John. And, and, and uh, thanks, thank you to the commentators for uh, their questions and their comments. Um, one could go on for a long time, and I won't. Um, on the problems of the Navy, 
I would say the basic difficulty was neither Nicholas nor the Naval Ministry ever saw a big ship they didn't like. Um, now to dig deeper uh, for the rationale behind that, uh, I, I think, uh, and it doesn't quite fully fit, but I'm going to invoke the, the scholarly equivalent of the Twinkie defense and that is to blame aberrant behavior, you know, on uh, eating too much food soaked with sugar and whatnot. But what happened was that the aberrant behavior in this case, uh, the aberrant behavior in this case is uh, why the abuses in power, why the skewed perceptions about the purposes of power, uh, and my scholarly uh, again, I the invoking of the scholarly equivalent of the Twinkie defense would be to blame everything on culture. Uh, and certainly one can dismiss that kind of attempt to put blame off, but there, there is something, there are several factors which are ingrained very deeply uh, in the conduct of the monarchy, and one of them is the view that conceives of power as personal property and not public trust. And certainly if you're looking at an autocracy, you're going to say, okay, what else is new? That's really uh, almost a definition of autocratic power. Uh, and yet at the same time, what happens is that, that as you look at the way the ministerial officials, not all of them to be sure, the general staff officers, not all of them to be sure, the way in which they approach their functions and their duty is the treatment of political power as property and not trust. Uh, what you would see, I think, after a looking at the materials for a long time is that the the generals Alexeyev, not Admiral, but General Alexeyev, Palitsyn, uh, to a certain extent, Brusilov, uh, that these folks are really the exception and not the rule, that the rule is, are the Sukhumlinovs, uh, the Grand Dukes who won't give up, the Tsar who will cede no power. And so if you'd want to look for a shortcut solution, among other things, for how to integrate policy and strategy. Uh, if you're a structuralist, there are, some, there are some very easy answers which might and might not have worked. Uh, looking at the State Defense Council, the first thing I do is make the Tsar sit as chair and not put the issue off to the surrogate cousin, or the, or the, the surrogate Tsar, the cousin in this case. Secondly, bring about a more even division of the membership of the council in order to reflect the actual proportion of the importance of the Navy and the ground forces, which would be something like two-thirds ground forces, one-fourth Navy. Uh, and the third, the third aspect of that would be to uh, bring someone like Admiral Guiden or Hayden, bring him in and make him deputy chair so that you actually do have an integrated body instead of of all of these free agents running around out there uh, affecting policy and integration. Uh, but again, uh, re and then reverting back to the issue of culture, uh, the imperial culture, the one in which sees, uh, the one in which, uh, the one that characterizes uh, the drive for power and a place in the sun as one that supports uh, imperial aggrandizement and prestige abroad. Uh, and w when, when this consensus emerges that governs the immediate post-1905 Russian world, the consensus emphasizes fiscal stringency, internal stability, and restoration of imperial prestige. Uh, and they're willing to do virtually anything to make stupid mistakes and make stupid decisions, to, uh, find desperate shortcuts to arrest to, in the direction of restoring imperial prestige, and that's part of the overall culture of the period. Okay, fine, thank you. I'd now I'd like to throw it open to, really to questions from anybody else who's, who's present, and we can go from there. Yes, 
Let's see if I've got this on. I'm very interested in Professor Taramoto's reference to a sphere involving Japan and the United States. It seems to me that the major elements of Japanese foreign policy regarding powers other than Russia in the year or two preceding the Russo-Japanese War involved not only the alliance with Great Britain, but also making every effort to avoid antagonizing the United States, which was in the Philippines. And in that regard, let me mention that I've seen in a private collection in New Hampshire an unknown and unpublished letter written in 1905 by Griscom, the US, ambassador to J the U.S. ambassador to Japan, in which Griscom says that shortly before the Russo-Japanese War began, Griscom had had great success in getting the Japanese government to resolve all kinds of issues that had dragged on for years between the U.S. Embassy and the Japanese government. In the letter, Griscom attributed that success to a sudden desire of the Japanese government to clean up irritants in U.S.-Japan relations before proceeding to war against Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Griscom appeared uh, in many different uh, uh, scenes, as you mentioned. Um, if I think of uh, the uh, pre-war uh, uh, U.S.-Japan uh, uh, relationship, uh, they, uh, as he mentioned, uh, cleaning up uh, uh, all the issues, was this uh, the Japanese request uh, through Griscom uh, to clean up those irritants? No, this was Griscom making requests to the Japanese government and getting rapid responses from the Japanese government all of a sudden when the Japanese government had dragged its heels on these issues for years. Uh, well, that's a difficult uh, question to answer, but uh, if I think of a pre-war uh, uh, U.S.-Japan relationship, there are um, uh, following things. As you know, uh, State uh, Secretary uh, John Hay uh, uh, started to talk about open uh, door policy uh, and uh, the uh, integrity of uh, ter territories. And the Japanese uh, uh, government uh, regarding uh, open door policy uh, uh, was uh, 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 responsive to uh, accepting that uh, open door policy because it was uh, to assure uh, equal uh, opportunity. And the by referring to uh, open door policy and territorial integrity, as the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, uh, Japan uh, uh, assigned the uh, alliance with the uh, Britain. So uh, in that sense, uh, there were certain agreements uh, between the, uh, Japan and the US. But uh, I, I do not know specifically what uh, cleaning up uh, the uh, irritants means. But at least what I can say is that, the, uh, as uh, uh, Hei uh, mentioned, uh, Japan uh, agreed on uh, the uh, open door policy in principle. And uh, the, um, in negotiating with the Britain and the uh, alliance and so forth, so they uh, t uh, used uh, Japan used that uh, basic principle, uh, talking about Korean issues. So uh, I, I think uh, that's uh, the extent of what I can say. Beyond that, uh, I am not familiar with the specifics about uh, those uh, cleaning up returns. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Matsumura. I, I am the president of the, uh, the Russo-Japanese uh, Research Association. Listening to your presentations, there is one 
thing that I wanted all of you to be cognizant of. And so if I may be allowed to speak about this. Jutaro Komura, it's about Komura, Jutaro Komura. September 26 happens to be the 150th birthday of Jutaro Komura. Nichinanshi is where he was born, and there uh, are some events slated to occur to commemorate this event. The city of Nichinan um, was the seat of the Obi clan, a rather small clan, but right next to it there was a large clan, the Satsuma clan of 720,000 Goku. From the Toyotama, Toyotomi period to the Meiji Restoration, this was a clan that managed to maintain its independence for 400 years. Ordinarily, if you have 50,000 Goku versus the 720,000 Goku, there's a huge uh, difference in power, so the smaller power would have been incorporated into the Satsuma clan. That would be the ordinary uh, pattern of events, given uh, traditional power structures. So the reason, so the question here is why were they able to s sustain themselves for 400 years? When a small country fights a large power, what is the type of diplomacy that is called for? There is a, a overlap between what occurred between Russia and, and Japan. The grandmother of Jutaro Komura was quite an, educa quite an educator and ever since he was a young boy, she imparted him knowledge of the history of the Obi clan. And what this meant was, apparently in the 400 years, the Obi clan and, and um, the Satsuma had numerous clashes. But even though the Obi clan were very small, they were never overcome. And that is because there was this idea of limited warfare. That is to say, win 60%, have like a 60% victory, and then look for an effective negotiator to negotiate peace. Make a request of this negotiator or mediator and, and settle the conflict. Apparently this was repeated in the history of the Obi clan. Oftentimes these mediators were the, the Toyotomi, came from the Toyotomi family and the Tokugawa family. So for 400 years, this was a strategy behind what allowed the Obi clan to maintain its independence. So Jutaro Komura grew up with this idea, I believe. So when Komura was faced with a very pressing situation where he knew that he would have to wage a war with Russia, the idea of a war on a limited scale was something that came to him. And he asked the United States to mediate the peace process. So the commemoration occurs on the 26th of September, and many events are being planned. Shoji Komura, who is the son number two of Komura, there is a paper that was written 
by Star Number Two that will be uh, published on the 26th of September, and there are many uh, interesting uh, stories that are being uh, written in the paper. So f I just wanted to tell you that for your information. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone want to add anything on, on Kamura? Okay. Other questions? Yes. If it's not a question, it's actually a comment. Я по-русски буду, чтобы была работа у переводчиков. Я думаю, наша конференция очень замечательно имела дебют, потому что мне сразу же захотелось включиться в дискуссию. Это была очень прекрасная презентация. Я решил присоединиться к разговору сразу же, хотя я не эксперт в истории русско-японских отношений. We published the new history of uh, international relations, four volumes, and it embraces the period of uh, uh, 1918 through 2004. There are a lot of stories um, there and articles there related to the Russo-Japanese war. And um, hearing all those presentations, uh, I uh, feel bad that uh, this uh, conference only took place now. Otherwise, we would have included many of uh, the presentations in our publication. I also uh, noticed that in our historic research, we uh, see no difference between the uh, notion of imperialist diplomacy and imperialist policies. Uh, today, hearing the um, interpretations of uh, um, our American colleagues uh, and Jennifer specifically, I um, understand that uh, if imperialist policy is captured or seizure of uh, foreign territories and uh, imperialistic diplomacy is uh, attempts to uh, avoid war with other imperialist uh, um, countries, then the uh, consequent um, history of Russo-Japanese relations can be understood in a totally different way uh, than we do. Then uh, we could um, uh, conclude that the revolution of uh, 1905 uh, was a barrier for um, Japanese and Russia to continue uh, beneficial for both sides, um, uh, imperialistic uh, diplomatic relations. As uh, it was mentioned here, uh, Portsmouth uh, agreement, uh, Portsmouth Treaty was not uh, very pleasant for Russia initially, but uh, at a later time, uh, Russia benefited a lot from its control of uh, uh, territories in China. And then uh, the uh, subsequent history of uh, Russian-Japanese relations could be understood as uh, an attempt to restore the formula of uh, um, Russo-Japanese imperialistic diplom uh, diplomacy. Then the uh, neutrality pact uh, could be understood as the uh, restoration of imperialistic diplomacy, because we always say that the most important feature in this pact was um, the promise of the Soviet Union not to go to war with Japan. And we don't like to mention the second part, uh, a more important part, um, which uh, basically, where basically the uh, Soviet Union um, uh, recognized uh, uh, Japanese interests, uh, and it was, uh, and, and J uh, Japan uh, promised not to enter the war. And um, uh, now it becomes clear why Japanese um, react uh, so vigorously uh, of the violation by Stalin of the neutrality pact. Uh, it was not just a legal violation, but also from the um, point of view of the imperialistic diplomacy was a betrayal of the whole concept uh, to make an agreement um, at the expense of a weaker party. Um, now, that means, again, from the point of view of the imperialistic diplomacy, there is an objective um, dead end. Uh, it could uh, only be possible uh, when China was, uh, if China uh, were weak. Um, in uh, 1942, uh, the Soviet Union lost its ability to uh, continue um, within the framework of imperialistic diplomacy. And, um, Today, the Russian Federation, we uh, don't call this uh, 
facts uh, as I'm calling them now. Uh, and uh, I have never looked uh, from this point of view at uh, those facts. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I'd like to thank uh, this very interesting comment that Professor Bogatudov made, and, and I hadn't really thought about uh, about the post. Uh, of course, my, my views are fixed on before 1917. I hadn't really thought about the post-1917 uh, similarities, but th that is a very intriguing point. Um, and the only parallel that I would, the, o the only other parallel I would draw, which confirms your uh, what your suggestion. Um, is that uh, sometimes it takes a, a military defeat really to concentrate your mind um, and to realize really what your priorities are. Uh, and in that sense, you might say that the Battle of Tsushima, um, the, the, 19, uh, the, the, the Soviet-Japanese parallel might be the Battle of Khalkin Gol or Nomanhan, um, where Japan realized that, well, perhaps um, you know, uh, we, we, should, we should deal with this power, power, power otherwise. So history doesn't always repeat itself, but it does sometimes um, resemble its predecessor. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of people w w wanting to speak. Uh, maybe one, two, three, four. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the most stimulating presentation. I have two questions. One related to the war and one related to the situation after the war. About the war, I think it is fair to say that uh, Japan-Russia war was a war of survival for Japan. However, the war was fought in the context of uh, pushing off Asia and, and entering Europe. And uh, Russia was Europe. And in this context, uh, we, yesterday we have heard this extreme attentiveness of Japan in adhering to the principle of international law. But in this context, I have one aspect which still perplexes me. And this is the question of what is usually called uh, treacherous attack against Russia, attack from behind. And uh, after Pearl Harbor, it is now even said that the Pearl Harbor has a precedent in Japan-Russia war. It is, you, <laughs> it is argued often. Was it really so? Now, in the paper we have read today, and uh, it's a common knowledge, I think, but uh, uh, before the war started, uh, Komura Jutaro uh, officially <coughs> informed Russia that uh, Japan is going to break off diplomatic relations. It's written in the, in the paper. But in those days, breaking off diplomatic relations, did it not tantamount really to declaration of war? I mean, well, in, from the point of view of then existing international law, uh, is it a traitorous attack of waging war after breaking of diplomatic relations? This is my first question. A second question about the situation after the war. I have learned a lot from today's presentation and this uh, distinction between the coherent policy of Japanese foreign policy before the war and the sort of confusion after the situation, which was uh, highlighted by uh, Ms. Siegel's uh, uh, presentation, was striking. However, my, my understanding was that po the Japanese foreign policy after the Japanese uh, Japan Russia war was not that confused. Clearly, when uh, the emphasis moved from Korea, to uh, Manchuria, particularly the southern part of Manchuria. There emerged options, clearly. And in the immediate reaction after the war, Japan reacted in several manner. As uh, Mr. Teramoto's paper indicates, probably there were some military who, who preferred to have a kind of direct government there. If that was that, an extreme position, then I think the other extreme position was the position taken in Tokyo. While Komura Jutaro was in Portsmouth, Edward Harriman visited Japan and agreed with Tokyo that the southern part of Nanshurian um, railway will be conducted jointly with the United States. When Komura Jutaro came back to Japan, he rebuked this decision. That was a confusion. <laughs> Usually these things doesn't happen. However, after that, the main line of the policy was uh, governed basically by the thinking of Komura Jutaro, 
And the gist was that Japan is going to keep southern part of Manchuria under its own sphere of influence, and for that, we'll shake hands with Russia and uh, shut out the United States, in essence. And the four accords from 1907 to 1916, the fourth accord being tantamount to an alliance with, the, uh, with Russia, basically confirmed that, 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 that tried to, confirm, to, 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 to establish that situation. I think in that sense, policy was, was fairly uh, consistent. It's it, it entirely different matter to argue retrospectively that the greatest mistake Japan has made was uh, keeping out the United States, and that uh, this line, which was which emerged slightly after the war, uh, in that line of uh, agreement between Harriman and Katra to run the southern part of uh, Manchurian Railway should have been Japan's uh, direction, retrospectively. But Japan has not taken this, this, this approach. Thank you. Okay, maybe you do the first question first and then the second, is that, okay. Who, who would like to start? あの、貴重なごあ、コメントどうもありがとうございました。Yes, thank you very much for those uh, questions. Well, first of all, let me say that I am not an expert uh, with regards to international law. I'm an expert in diplomatic uh, uh, history. As far as uh, raiding Port Arthur after declaring uh, ending diplomatic ties. Of course, there was uh, some accusation coming from Russia because of what happened, but uh, my sense is that, as you know, Russia, 20 or 30 years before that, when they fought Turkey, uh, I have been informed that there was a surprise attack of some sort. And as you know, there was no explicit treaty that talked about how to declare a war. And this is why. The, the Hague Committee uh, was created, and Dr. Runo from France, at the start of the con con conference, spoke about how there was the absence of rules of declaration of war and express the need to set such rules. And the Hague Peace uh, Treaty negotiations began with this background. So I don't think it was uh, anything to be proud of, but conveying that you're breaking diplomatic ties does indicate that at least to some degree uh, that at least minimum standards were met. There was no explicit language in the international law until it was enshrined in 1927. So except this would be the extent of my knowledge as far as responding to your first question. Now, as far as your second question, Professor Siegel, my feeling is, is that in order to delineate the uh, the situation there in an easy to understand way. He she spoke about this bit of a contrast that existed between pre and post war. But I, I would agree with you that there was no major confusion post war. And the military, um, as far as military action, Komura during the war and after the war spoke about territorial integrity of Manchuria, the Japanese army created a military regime there and would not budge. The army treated Manchuria as if it was its, its own land. And, and the government followed eventually. The most egregious example was the military regime that existed in Manchuria. And, and Sionji, our prime minister, had 
had actually went to actually went to uh, Manchuria himself, and the Japanese military um, treated the, the, the people from the, the, the Manchuria government very badly, and Sionji was very uh, critical of the treatment of these people. And the uh, military regime was put to an end, and there was some closure there. There was also the line of Hayashi and, and the line of Komura. The, the Portsmouth Treaty was something that was born thanks to Komura. And there was, a, there was language in the port the Treaty of Portsmouth that there needs to be consent given by the Chinese. And he went to Pe Beijing uh, to get consent of, of China. Hayashi's, the Hayashi's line was somewhat different. He, he was a son of a, a medical doctor. And since young, he was rather a rational human being, and he realized that Manchuria was not part of Japanese land. And when you look at the history of mankind, he mentioned how he mentioned in the press at that time that no country has ever been able to maintain foreign territory that it, it won through military means. So once Ito put a stop to the military regime in Manchuria, I don't believe there was a whole lot of inconsistency in Japanese diplomacy. There were some influential people in Japan who criticized the more rational Hayashi approach who supported the uh, line ex pr promoted by Komura. So there was a little bit of, uh, of some disconsent there. But overall, I don't believe there was that much of inconsistency. There was some difference in opinions, but I, I don't believe there was a whole lot of confusion. Very briefly. Sorry, May, just very briefly. I'm, I apologize if I used the word confused to describe Japanese post-war. Uh, policy. I think conflicted was probably more the term that I was going for, but not not confusion in the same way that we see confusion. It's Japan's problems were not the same that we see in the in Russian policy formation in the pre-war period at all. So, two very brief points about declaring war um, and uh, and attacking. Uh, the first is that uh, it, it appears, um, and I always have to say appears with Nicholas, but it appears that Nicholas uh, didn't think that the Japanese would attack without a, a declaration of war. He kept on telling his subordinates, like Admiral Alaseyev, you know, we've got we've to let them strike the first blow. But he, he, I think he, he assumed that it would come um, without declaration of war. Nevertheless, um, there were other, uh, other Russians, including, for example, um, Admiral Makarov, um, sadly killed uh, off of Port Arthur, but one of the most intelligent naval commanders, who um, right around the time that the Japanese broke off diplomatic relations said, uh, be very careful, uh, because this is exactly what happened um, 10 years earlier with the Kaohsiung incident, uh, you know, the, during the, the Sino-Japanese War also began without a formal declaration of war. Um, and um, if, if the Russians suddenly learned after uh, the 8th of February 1904 that uh, nations were capable of attacking without declaring war, um, uh, it, it didn't make, you know, uh, whether it was, whether it was po uh, uh, possible or not, um, the very fact is that public opinion didn't really turn against, uh, against Japan. Most people thought, well, you know, uh, uh, Russia was at fault. Uh, very final point is that uh, it's it's really a shame that that uh, that that the Roosevelt administration did not uh, pay much attention to this. I'm talking about the second Roosevelt administration uh, in 1945, and had they realized what was what happened in at Kaohsiung and at Port Arthur, they might have been a bit more prepared. Thanks. Uh, I just want to announce that again, the panel was scheduled to end around 11, but since we started late, I'd like to keep it going to about 11:15 or so. And Mr. Mary, I believe you were next. Yes, I'd like to ask Drs. Menning and Steinberg to elaborate a bit on something that looms fairly large in their paper, but did not, they didn't have enough time to get into as much in their comments, which is lessons not learned in terms of naval uh, tactics and fleet design. 
because in many ways the, the, the period leading to the Russo-Japanese War was the first modern naval arms race, steel-hulled modern steam propulsion warships, and it was watched very closely by other navies. I mean, there were British observers on Togo's fleet uh, flagship at Tsushima, uh, and both Russian and Japanese fleets were built around Mahanist big ship doctrine. They were both built around battle squadrons. But the Japanese were also extremely innovative in new weapons and tactics. And by the beginning of the war, the Imperial Japanese Navy was generally recognized as being the best in the world in cruiser tactics, in torpedo destroyer tactics, and in fighting at night. And it was that perception which led to the Russian fleet panic in the North Sea and the fiasco at Dogger Bank. And a number of other navies in watching the war noticed that until Tsushima, it wasn't the Japanese battleships that scored the major victories. It was this more balanced fleet. And a lot of this was reflected in fleet design. The Germans did a lot, the Italians, the Americans, the British not so much. The one navy which reflected these lessons the least was the Russian. And that's curious not just because they had the most immediate lessons, but because their geography would have led them in this direction rationally, because they had of necessity three separated fleets that operated in narrow, shallow bodies of water. And yet, their reaction to losing two battle fleets in the Far East was to seek to build a battle fleet for the Baltic, which is probably the least appropriate bo body of water for, for such dreadnought-type ships, rather than learning from the small ship torpedoes, the new technologies that had been pioneered against them by Japan, they were in some ways the least innovative navy in the arms race leading to 1914. You dwell a little bit on what the answers why in your paper, and yet it is, I am still baffled that because some other navies did learn the correct lessons, or at least partially. Why in St. Petersburg did they not? Well, an easy answer to that would be that the leading apostle of, I'm not sure I would call it balanced fleet, but at least the leading apostle of looking at Russia's geographical situation and then proceeding from an analysis of the geographical situation to determine what mixture of assets you needed in a naval sense was Admiral Makarov, and he had been killed in, in, uh, on the Petropavlovs in, 19, in April 1904. Uh, but more to the point, uh, fo or more to the point, following that in 1906, when you begin to see the deliberations within the Naval Ministry and within the Naval General Staff, uh, yeah, they believe in a balanced fleet. That actually, the squadrons that they what they talk about is the creation of integrated total or whole battle squadrons. So that when Captain Brusilov talks about what kind of naval assets they need, they must build those naval assets by entire. Uh, squadron-sized entities, and there's a balance between dreadnoughts, heavy cruisers, light cruisers, and destroyers. But the problem is, it comes to be, is when you look at where those assets will be applied, and even the Russian ship's captains who are experienced, you know, they look at it and say, well, it's going to be awfully hard to maneuver dreadnought-sized assets in either the Finnish Gulf or the Baltic. Uh, and uh, that uh, why the naval general staff flies in the face of that kind of wisdom, I don't know. It could be the perceptions that the only way they could get a naval const uh, ship const or a naval construction underway was to emphasize coastal defense and somehow make the irrational, logical leap that 
a, a full squadron on this integrated squadron would also provide that. You know, there's that, that that's always sort of the, uh, how should I say, the bone of contention among the Navy folks when they argue about what you need for superiority. The argument will come down, no, if we build uh, torpedo boats, destroyers, and tie them to coastal gunfire and mine warfare, that's not enough. What you need to do is you need to spread the defensive envelope, get it away from shore, and the only way you can do that is with blue water capability. So there are all those themes and nuances uh, that play in and out of this argument. And essentially, I think bottom line is that when Admiral Dikoff says, we must proceed with the construction of dreadnought-sized battleships because that's all that's going to save our shipyards. But oh, by the way, they didn't have the technology to build turbine engines and so what they would have to do was lay down the ships and then go to the British <laughs> to, to, to get the turbine engine technology. So, I mean, it's a very interesting set of propositions. Yeah, I, I want to say I think in a way you're answering your own question because what is rational in our minds I think is very different to what the Russians were thinking at the time. And I want to emphasize something that Bruce said earlier. Nicholas II never met a ship he didn't like. And you're dealing with this fractured system where you have to get the Tsar's approval in order to have anything. And so then all of the, the strategic thinking and all of the lessons learned start to break down in the very real and present budgetary battle. I don't, I don't know if that helps, but in, in the end you, ha you have this situation where you have enormous needs in every direction. And this idea of a blue water navy becomes dominant in the Tsar's mind. And I think something that needs to be thrown out here is, is that the, the Tsar is, is very much attuned to this idea of something you brought up in terms of, in many ways, the first modern naval arms race. And what that symbolizes in the greater scheme of what our colleagues down here were talking about in terms of imperialism. You can't be an imperialist power without this blue water navy. So it's very complicated. It's, I mean, it's a good point to, to bring up. And one final point about that, as John was making his commentary, I was thinking, going back to the 30s and looking at the debates in Congress about why they should, why they should fund uh, a program that underwrote the, con the, uh, the construction of the B-17 bomber. And essentially, that program was sold to Congress because the B-17 would be uh, an instrument of coastal defense. Okay, uh, David Wolf, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Scher. Um, I wanted to bring up a couple of points that I thought came out in the, uh, the conference that was held at Keio University in May that I think are slightly at variance with the way presentations were made here. Um, um, I found this, um, in a way, it's a sort of charming illustration, and of course it makes me very angry, and uh, especially if I was Japanese, I would feel immediately angry if I saw this picture. Um, I thought that the general conclusion that we had reached in the course of the papers that were presented at Keio, especially a work presented by Tatiana Filipova, who's sitting across from me, um, suggested that the Russian vision of Japan was really quite mixed. Um, the Japanese presentation after the war of the Russian vision of Japan is they didn't, tr they didn't respect us and now they're going to respect us, but in fact, from the pre-war period and the war period, it's very mixed. There's a lot of different images that are available. And work that was done by Professor Wada Haruki that was presented at the conference also made it extremely clear that the top people, the naval attaches and the mil military attaches, with certain significant exceptions of people who were poor attaches, understood that Japan was a potent force and warned directly to the Tsar and all of the generals, everyone heard it from them. People like Nicholas, people like Bezobrazov, people like Alexeyev, the people, the people who basically have no respect for their own people either, 
and basically consider their peasants dirt to be sacrificed in a war have the same kind of impression of the Japanese. Those who believe in the value of their own blood um, have no respect for the common man in their own country or in other countries. So I just wanted to say that I felt that that was something <clears throat> that had come out quite clearly during the Keio conference and was not fully presented in this paper. Um, and of course, we'll hear more about Vitya from uh, Steve Upton um, this evening. Um, secondly, sort of more on the Japan side than the Russian side, um, it's always, and I think it came out a bit during the discussion as well, it's very hard to come up with a very good picture of what Komura was thinking. Komura leaves no private papers. We don't have an inside story. Komura presents itself. Instead, we have the, uh, the works that were used in this paper, which are materials prepared by Komura's private secretary, Honda, in the 1920s and 30s, if I remember correctly, and his presentation shifts in the 1920s and 30s as the political situation shifts in the 20s and 30s. So our vision of Komura is largely a post hoc vision of Komura. We have some contemporary materials, but these materials are not quite the same thing as a Katsura autobiography. We don't have an autobiography for Komura. So there's a little bit imbalance in the, the quality of the source material for the two sides. And of course, I want to come back to that very interesting point that was made about the Katsura Haraman agreement that's made while Komura is at Portsmouth. And of this, then Komura comes back, and Komura is generally blamed for the Japanese then saying, no, we disavow this agreement that was preliminary and we're not going to go through with it. On the other hand, one can well imagine the American side saying, we sent over this semi-official person who reached agreement with the prime minister and acting foreign minister of Japan while we were negotiating with Japan the, the, the treaty. And then once we had finished negotiating the treaty, they abrogated their agreement with us. I mean, Taft Katsura is also an agreement that's made in a semi-official way. It's agreed memorandum. It's not between direct between departments of between foreign ministries. And you know, Haram and Katsura is very much in a similar vein, I think. And so from the American side, one can well imagine the Americans feeling that they had been sort of uh, you know, sort of been played with. They had an agreement, and then once the, the treaty was reached, then, well, the agreement was brushed aside. So, of course, that doesn't come out because we're not looking at the American side yet, but I think it's worth mentioning. Um, finally, and very briefly, um, Professor Yokibe's point about the short-term advantage, I think, is very important because it reminds us that we need to put together the diplomatic logic and the military logic because the decision to stop doing diplomacy is a decision about how the logic of military action will take place and therefore it was quite wise to put these, these two papers together to make one panel. Um, well done. Thank you. Okay. okay, any comments from the panel? Yes, um, and, and I, I thank uh, David for uh, pointing out some things which unfortunately in the space of 10 minutes uh, I could not, um, which is that Russian views um, about Japan were quite mixed. Um, uh, however, I should point out that the real problem was um, when, I, when I discussed to Russian diplomacy, when I, when I referred to Russian diplomacy being unable to take Japan seriously, um, that was not because uh, Russian diplomacy was united. Uh, in fact, it was very famously divided. Uh, and indeed, um, you know, one could spend several hours discussing the ways in which some people saw Japan as a serious power, uh, other people did not. Um, and even Vita, by the way. Um, in his memoirs, uh, he does, uh, and certainly just before the war, he does take Japan seriously. But certainly in, in 1895, um, when, he, when he very much advocates uh, an alliance with uh, China, his view of, of Japan is rather different. Uh, so it, it, you know, things do change, and um, one can't in, inject too much complexities. But the real tragedy was that overall Russian diplomacy, uh, indeed, um, I could not take it seriously, and I think uh, I will just uh, fin I'll, I'll just very briefly s uh, illustrate this with a possibly an apocryphal anecdote, which is that um, at the Winter Palace during the New Year's reception, uh, 
um, which, which of course, given the Gregorian calendar, uh, the Julian calendar was a little bit later. Uh, it was in mid in mid January. Um, Nicholas met with the uh, Japanese um, minister then, uh, and you know spoke some uh, voiced some platitudes about yes, he hoped that the negotiations, which are very critical, that that peace would be maintained between the two countries. Uh, and then, as the ambassador walked away, I guess for for a drink, uh, Nicholas turned to an aide and uh, said, you know, this man is an absolute fool. Why doesn't he just look at a map and compare Russia versus Japan? Thank you, David. Well, thank you very much for those very insightful comments. First of all, regarding Komura, it's true that there are no personal memos or papers, and, and that can be a problem for us. That said, Komura uh, did, in fact, submit all kinds of uh, opinion letters and documents to the cabinet compared to other uh, minister of foreign affairs. They were quite voluminous, and there's much information that can be gleaned by looking at these documents. That, so that's, and also Kumataro Honda, who is his personal secretary, uh, if you uh, read his autobiography, he speaks a lot about Komura. It's certainly true that in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, there was uh, some change. That said, this was a man who was very close to Kumura, and, and I don't believe you can overlook what, what Honda says in, the, in his writings. So you may have to take into account the background of the time, but look, if you look at Katsura's biography as well, you can see that Komura was someone who was very committed to thinking about Jap Japan's future. Uh, this is why he promoted the idea of the Anglo-Japanese uh, alliance, because in his mind, Korea was very important. So he had this uh, grand scheme in mind, and I think uh, much of uh, these documents speak to that. And now, as far as the Katsura and, and Harriman agreement is concerned, the Japanese logic was as follows. In Portsmouth, Port Arthur, uh, Dailin, uh, and uh, the Southern Manchuria Railway were the only things that we were able to get. So if you look at Article 6, in order to inherit Russia's uh, leasehold rights in China, we needed to have the consent of, of China. There was also the riot in Hibiya Park, uh, which was a display of indignation of the Japanese people. So after making serious efforts, these were the uh, fruits of his labor that he were, was able to garner. So that was the situation in which this agreement was negotiated. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, Ron, I think you had a question over there? And that'll be the last question for the panel. Go ahead. Uh, it's, it's late, and it may change uh, focus. It'll be appropriate to ask it this afternoon. So uh, with your consent, I'll, I'll, you can call on me this afternoon, and I'll ask it then. Fine. Th thank you. OK. Uh, as we ran a little late, but I think the discussion w was a very good, uh, good one. And I want to thank not only the presenters, but also everybody here for a great, great discussion. Thank you.